All right, so we are almost at five after. Let's go ahead and get started. Um, welcome to April's Connect and Explore webinar. Um, uh, next slide, please. Yeah, so our agenda for today, uh, we have a very special spotlight today uh, featuring speakers from Cooperative Extension and USDA for Cooperative Extension's National Framework for Health Equity and Well-Being, Implementation and Intersection with Encore Partners. Uh, after our spotlight today, we'll have time for a question and answer session. Um, so you'll see a Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. If you do have a question um, during the session, feel free to place it there. And then we'll close today with announcements from Encore. We'll do next slide, please. So we are delighted today to welcome um, our speakers to um, today's webinar. We have an exciting group of panelists. Um, Sheila Fleischhacker um, is the serves as the National Science Liaison at USDA NIFA. In this role, she works with various groups to strengthen the food safety and nutrition centric agency interactions, as well as providing linkages between those stakeholders and appropriate NIFA staff based in Kansas City. She previously served as the Senior Advisor of Nutrition and Food Safety at USDA Office of the Chief Scientist on detail from the National Institutes of Health. During her federal service, she helped put forth the first of its kind National Nutrition Research Roadmap and chaired a USDA Interdepartmental Nutrition Workshop Series. Suzanne Sluka uh, currently serves as the Deputy Director for the Institute of Food Safety and Nutrition at USDA NIFA. Prior to joining NIFA, Dr. Sluka served over 15 years with Cooperative Extension Service as the Associate Director at Montana State University Extension and in several leadership roles at South Dakota State University Extension. Roger Rennekamp serves as the Health Director for the Cooperative Extension Section of the Association of Public and Land-Grant Universities, where he focuses on building the capacity of the nation's land-grant universities to improve the health and well-being of the nation through community engagement. He has held several administrative and faculty positions at several major public universities, including the Ohio State University, Oregon State University, and the University of Kentucky. Carrie Gabbert uh, is a visiting instructor at West Virginia University Extension Program as the program coordinator for WVU's CDC High Obesity Program Grant. She serves as the health associate with Extension Foundation, providing support for the implementation of Cooperative Extension's National Framework for Health Equity and Well-Being. My name is Melissa Van Orman, and I will be moderating um, today's session. I am the communications uh, manager at Encore, and uh, again, I'm delighted to welcome you to today's webinar. We have a um, few announcements, just sort of housekeeping before we get started. If you have any technical assistance at all, please let us know using the chat feature. We can um, help you or email us at encore at fhi360.org. And again, if you have a question for our speakers, um, feel free to place your question in the Q&A box um, at the bottom of your screen, and we will um, uh, make sure the speakers um, are see it. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, we will also be uh, tweeting uh, during today's webinar, so you can join the uh, conversation online using the hashtag ConnectExplore at, at Encore on Encore's Twitter page. And then before we get started with our spotlight, uh, we would like to hear from you. So we have a couple uh, interactive poll questions. Um, so uh, polls should uh, have just popped up on your screen. The first is, how familiar are you with Cooperative Extension's National Framework for Health Equity and Well-Being? 
A, I've read the entire document. B, I've skimmed through it or read some sections. C, I've heard of it. Or D, what is it? So you have a couple moments here to register your response. Okay. So we have, everyone has answered. And as you can see, it looks like we have a, a really nice range of uh, experiences with the document. 18% um, uh, of you have read the entire thing. 23% have skimmed it. 38% uh, have heard of it. And 21% are new to the document. So um, welcome. We, we welcome you all. And we have a second question for you. Uh, we'd like to know who's in the audience today and um, what uh, capacity or what role you currently are in. So A, extension employee, B, direct service provider, C, program agency management, D, public policy, E, researcher, F, student, G, general interest or other. And so again, you have a, just a few moments here to register your response. Okay, I think we have got everyone who is responded. Um, and it looks like we've got um, a, a lot of folks in the audience from Cooperative Extension. So we, we welcome you um, to the uh, webinar 52%. Um, go ahead and... And then we have... Um, Program agency management. Uh, we have several researchers uh, as well as students in the audience. So welcome. And then um, as well as direct service providers. So welcome again to everyone um, for joining us today for this really exciting conversation. Uh, next slide. So from here, um, we will turn it over to Suzanne, who will be um, leading us off on our spotlight discussion. Yes, thank you for the invitation to be here uh, with you all today. And I am glad to share the Zoom room floor um, with these individuals that um, have already been introduced. Um, so we will go ahead and get kicked off. So just a quick overview slide here on NIFA. In fiscal year uh, 2022, we awarded more than 2,500 grants, totaling 2.2 billion. And our portfolio of programs is seeing an impact across many facets of nutrition and health. And you, as you can see there in the, uh, the diagram, we impact both research, education, and extension, and they're constantly working and intersecting um, together to get that information and, and knowledge out across the nation. So next slide, please. Here it just shows our USDA priorities and um, looking across the board, anything anywhere from climate change through climate smart ag, forestry and clean energy to creating more and better market opportunities um, to the reason why we're here today tackling food and nutrition insecurity. And also the reason why we're here today is advancing racial justice, equity, opportunity and rural prosperity. So many linkages. So next slide. Um, here you can see the definition, and one year ago on March 17th, Agricultural Secretary Tom Vilsack released this new national strategy report of our USDA actions on nutrition security. And the report highlights USDA's commitment to advancing nutrition security and that consistent access to safe, nutritious food that supports optimal health and well-being for all Americans. And so promoting food and nutrition sec security is a core priority for the USDA, and it supports the Biden's administration whole of government approach to improve health and wellness, reduce diet-related chronic diseases, and advance health equity. 
So as you can see here on the slide, there's the national strategy on hunger, nutrition, and health, and that was unveiled last fall. And it's really a roadmap that the actions that the federal government will take to end hunger and reduce these diet-related diseases by 2030. And NIFA is a proud participant in this endeavor, and it's anchored by, by five pillars to improving food access and affordability, integrating nutrition and health, empowering consumers to make and have access to healthy choices, supporting physical activity for all, and enhancing nutrition and food security research. And we are happy to continue to invest and provide an evidence base to accelerate action in each of these pillars. So how do we do that? That's really the next slide, is that we're providing financial assistance in the forms of competitive and then our capacity and infrastructure grants. So our competitive grants are these awards for that fundamental and applied research, extension and education activities and projects that also integrate all three of these functions as well. And then we also have the capacity and infrastructure grants that help uh, support um, extension and projects like you're gonna hear about today um, as well. So next slide. These are just a sampling and I'm not gonna go in depth. Um, we encourage you, we actually on May 8th have an upcoming webinar. If you want to hear more about these programs, um, check out our website and we can put that in the chat box as well. But these are just a few of our, our AFRI foundational programs in our institute um, that supports, again, nutrition and health um, and, and nutrition security. Next slide. We also have non-AFRI programs that are competitive. I talked about the competitive slide earlier, anywhere from our community food projects program to our food and agricultural service learning program to food safety outreach grants, and then to our Gus Schumacher, as many of you hear it as GUSNIP, which is our nutrition incentive program, which um, encompasses produce prescription and nutrition incentives, and also a training and technical assistance evaluation center. And so these are all really broad in scope and they connect us to communities and other networks. Next slide. Under capacity, we do have the extension program again, you'll hear about, but we also have our FNEP, our expanded food and nutrition education program. And this program is critical. And our latest results from 2022 show that 94% of adults that participate in FNEP programs, they improved what they ate and they consumed more fruits and vegetables. And the same for youth, about 85% of our young participants also reported this increased knowledge in choosing healthy foods. Um, so last year, the FNEP community worked with over 45,000 adults and 187 um, young people across the nation. So again, just a sampling of other programs that we have. I'm not going to go through these, but we wanted to just highlight and show that we have many programs across NIFA, not in my, just in my institute, that really touch on and relate to nutrition security. So if you're looking to find us, um, we encourage you to look for our national program leaders. They're really um, our link to these programs and you can find them on our website. And we'll also place that in the, in the chat box for you as well to, to get in touch with them and to learn more about these programs. So finally, the purpose of us being here today is to really talk about this collaboration uh, that we do have with Cooperative Extension. And so we are using a letter of cooperative agreement to really help advance the implementation of Cooperative Extension's national framework for health equity and well-being. And I'm just so excited because I've had the opportunity to be involved, as you heard in my bio, um, since its inception as an Extension colleague working at a land-grant institution to now in my various roles here uh, through USDA NIFA as a liaison member. And I really want to give a big thank you to um, Dr. Sheila Fleischacker, who really serves as that liaison um, and promoting the work uh, with the Cooperative Extension and this framework each and every day. So I'm excited for you to hear about the framework, how it's going to elevate the role that Extension plays in promoting and elevating nutrition security, but also in advancing racial justice, equity, opportunity, and rural prosperity. So I am going to turn it over to Dr. Roger Renenkamp. Well, thank you so much, Suzanne, and I greatly appreciate the opportunity to be with everyone today to talk a little bit about what cooperative extension, county extension offices across the nation are doing broadly to advance health equity and well-being, but more specifically, what they are doing in the area of childhood obesity. 
Next slide, please. So as Suzanne spoke earlier, um, and is the USDA and its National Institute of Food, Agricult Food and Agriculture partners with a number of land grant universities across the country, more specifically, 111 public universities and colleges that have an explicit obligation to make sure that the knowledge resources of those universities are extended to communities across the country to advance health equity and well-being. And uh, most of you are familiar with your county extension office that might, that probably is in the county where you reside. But each of those county extension offices is connected with one of those 111 land grant universities across the country. And those land grant universities in turn receive support and funding from USDA NIFA to do some of the community outreach and engagement and extension work that is helping to improve the quality of life for people across the country. So you may not be aware that uh, there are 32,000 extension employees in these county extension offices or branch offices of these universities. And there's one in every county in the country. So we're very pleased uh, to be able to have those county extension offices as an asset to do the work that we do. Now, lots of folks think about cooperative extension or those county extension offices uh, where you go for technical assistance or related to agriculture. But the reality is that a large proportion of these extension employees have training in nutrition or public health. They may have um, an MPH or a certification in some health area. But, you know, we're about, you know, the work that I do is really about uh, figuring out what it is that we as a collective network of 32,000 employees and 3,200 offices and 1111, 111 land grant universities, what we do together. And we knew that we needed some guiding work or a guiding document to help us think about how do we go about building capacity and strengthening the work that we do to advance health equity and well-being. Next slide, please. So, and I won't talk about the whole process and all the organizations that sanction these, uh, that have sanctioned this document to make, but to make a long story short, uh, Cooperative Extension developed what is called the National Framework for Health Equity and Well-Being in July of 2021. Suzanne mentioned we had a group of people who worked together to develop this framework. We vetted it with 500 partners before its release. And, um, uh, if you want to take a look at that framework, I think uh, Sheila has probably put the link to that document uh, in the chat. So you can view that in, you know, after the webinar or in your spare time. But uh, uh, I think you'll enjoy looking at it in the format of what we call a flipping book that uh, allows you to browse the document, but also uh, click on some different resources and links across uh, throughout the document that uh, explain a little bit more about what some of the concepts are that were some of the core principles. Uh, that we focused on in the development of the framework. So next slide, please. So, you know, I, I, I hate to read to you guys. I know you all can read together, but this is the opening statement of, uh, of our framework document that um, reads, every day people make choices that impact, impact their health. And we've spent enormous amounts of energy to informing, toward informing and influencing these choices. But unfortunately, far too little attention has been paid to the contextual influences on health. And as a result, our public discourse around health has been framed as a personal responsibility, where if you're in good health, it's a personal success. And if it's ill health, it's a personal failing. Next slide, please. We'll talk more about that in just a few minutes, but there were three themes that guided our work in the development of the framework. First of all is health equity. Second is the social determinants of health. And then the third is collective action, how we work together across multiple sectors of community life to make sure that we make sure that all individuals are in fact able to experience optimal health. So let's talk first about health equity really quickly. 
So health equity exists, and this is the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation definition, and there's also definition from CDC and the World Health Organization. But you know, we really like the the uh, first definition um, and really subscribe to that as we go about our work. But Robert Wood Johnson Foundation says health equity exists when everyone has a fair and just opportunity to be as healthy as possible. But unfortunately, we know that that's not the case, is that there are a number of factors beyond the individual or the individual's control that influence um, their ultimate level of health. Next slide, please. So um, as we talk about equity, a lot of you have seen different slides that kind of explain the difference between inequality and equality and an equity-centered approach. But just recently, I think uh, many of you have probably seen this particular slide that goes beyond equity to talk about justice, where in equity, we employ custom tools that identify problems experienced by individuals or certain communities. But justice, focuses on really fixing what in a lot of cases is a broken system and making sure that um, all individuals have equal, equal access both to the tools and opportunities that allow them to be healthy. Next slide, please. The second is social determinants of health. And, and this is uh, not a new term to most of you, but it's really the factors and conditions beyond the individual that influence uh, overall health and well being. And we are in the process of really making a change from an exclusive focus on individual behavioral change to really looking at what a lot of people are calling PSEs or policy systems and environment change, particularly through our SNAP Ed and FNET programs that Suzanne talked about. And it really looks at uh, using approaches that are custom tailored to the needs of communities help uh, bearing the greatest health burdens. Next slide. And, you know, it, it, one of the reasons, you know, as we think about what are the drivers of health, you know, about 30% of one's health is really based on their individual behaviors. But the remaining 70%, and you can look at other breakdowns of this, but certainly by far the largest driver of health are those conditions or contexts in which people live. And our focus is increasingly on some of those contexts. Next slide, please. And where does systems change happen? We know that we work directly with the individual, but systems change happens at the interpersonal level, the organizational level, community level, and policy level. And those of you that are familiar with social uh, 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 models of, um, of change or nested um, models of really thinking about how the individual is engaged in uh, those contextual factors. You know, this isn't new at all to you. Next slide, please. So, you know, and, and uh, you know, one of the best ways I think to really uh, exemplify the concept of social determinants of health is really through an indicator that we all are concerned about, and that's life expectancy, right? So, you know, there is um, one of the things that we're learning is that we're is that advances in data science over the last few years have allowed us to uh, display um, in a very graphic form, you know, where people are experiencing some of the greatest health inequities. And, and as I said, life expectancy is one. And, and I just picked out, for example, uh, Washington, D.C. area. And some of you are familiar with Washington, D.C. And if you are, you know, you know that now we're able to really break down uh, down to the census tract or the zip code level of a number of different variables. And this one happens to be life expectancy. And, you know, in one area of Washington, D.C. and the Friendship Heights area, if you go out connect Connecticut Avenue, you know this very well. But in uh, in one census tract, the um, average average life life expectancy is 96 years of age. And uh, all of us say, well, I want to live there if I'm going to live to 96. Well, our next slide, you know, shows another area that's probably only 15 to 20 miles away. But if you go right across the Anacostia River, you know that there are also a census tract that average life expectancy is only 63. So, you know, as we think about the difference in life expectancy of 33 years across a geographic area, you know, that is maybe 15 to 20 miles apart, we realize that maybe it's not just their knowledge about behavior, uh, about healthy behaviors and healthy eating. Uh, there's other factors involved. So uh, next slide, please. 
I, uh, and and uh, again, you can also see at the mer very macro level uh, where uh, the, the prevalence of obesity is greatest. And uh, if you look at the macro level, you can look at um, the Appalachian region of the United States. You can look at the Deep South. You can look at our border communities, and you look at our our uh, our um, tribal populations across the country for at the macro level that really are experienced highest levels of obesity. So next slide, I go back to kind of the town where I live, and that's in Lexington, Kentucky. You can use that same map, and this is based on the places database of CDC. And you can look at uh, here in Lexington, Kentucky, and that's not where I am today, but you can also see where the highest prevalence of, of obesity is within the various census tracts of Lexington, Kentucky. And the darkest areas represent the areas of the greatest prevalence of obesity, uh, overweight or obesity. Next slide, please. So as I mentioned, we're moving towards or addressing the root causes of obesity and moving away from viewing personal choices as the sole cause of obesity. And we're training extension staff how to broaden their thinking about root causes and beginning to understand the role of obesogenic environments and conditions you know, as, uh, uh, as a causal factor. And so we're really thinking about how we do things differently, moving away from only direct education to perhaps another strategy that I think we talk about in the next slide. And that's really about collective impact. We know that uh, we can't solve these community or address these community conditions or social determinants of health um, as a single agency. It has to be through multi-sector coalitions or collaboration where we work together, not just as agencies or organizations, but involving people with lived experience and ideally bringing young people into the picture as well, because the voices and power of young people to make changes in communities is, 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 is quite powerful. Um, so I want to stress that too, um, you know, as, as I've said many times is data, data tell us what is, it's the people who live in the community that tell us why it is. And it involves meaningful engagement with the community. So that's the third theme. Next slide, please. And we all know processes, you know, that are aligned around a common purpose. And this is simply a model, a, one of the many models for how we can accomplish collective impact. I won't spend time on that because a lot of you know the process of doing this work. Next slide, please. So also in this national framework for health equity and well-being, we also advanced five recommendations for the cooperative extension system. And I'm going to turn it over to uh, Carrie Gabbert, who's going to walk us through some of the things that we actually learned about the 32,000 employees across the cooperative extension system and some of the challenges and opportunities that they're facing across the country, particularly in um, addressing these recommendations. So Carrie, it's all yours from here. Thank you, Roger. Um, next slide, please. So Roger mentioned the five recommendations of the framework and some of the ways that Extension is trying to look at, at a new approach to our work in health. Um, but part of that understanding was trying to figure out where does the system fall right now? Um, how do people feel about the framework? What is their capacity to implement it? What are some barriers or opportunities that they've identified? So next slide, please. Oh. Sorry, can you go back a slide? Then back another. Thank you. <laughs> so CCHE, the Center for Community Health and Evaluation, um, conducted a, a, a system-wide assessment of readiness to implement the framework. Uh, this was funded by the USDA NIFA through the Extension Foundation. Next slide, please. So this, this process, the listening sessions, consisted of surveys, um, six different focus groups, and we got recommendations and feedback around the, the individual recommendations. The first one advancing health equity as a core system value. Um, we got a lot of feedback that that is very challenging in our current social political climate. Uh, the word equity itself has political connotations. And so one of the barriers to implementing the framework is just the, the terminology and the language that we're using as part of the framework. And that there's a need for 
resources and tools and training about how to have some of these conversations in our communities where we address the concept of health equity in a way that is not putting up barriers or making people shut down or, or feel resistant to, to the overarching goal, which is giving everybody the opportunity to lead the healthiest life possible. Next slide, please. So the second recommendation in the framework, utilizing community assessment processes and integrating data science, um, really is an understanding of a way to use precision data to, again, look at where there's specific pop pockets within our communities, um, areas of the population that are suffering from health inequities. Um, and so that is a way to combine the the embracing health equity, but also using data and research to help us um, identify that, hey, there are specific folks who don't have access to the same health promoting resources. So again, there's also a need for training both of extension professionals, but also providing that support to our community partners about how to use these data tools to get a better understanding of, of people and places that aren't having access to the same resources. Next slide, please. So the third recommendation, investing in the success and visibility of extensions, health-related professionals, programs, and initiatives. Um, today's webinar is a great example of that. Extension has been doing work in the health arena for decades. Um, Roger mentioned the extensive uh, network of professionals in the extension system that are doing work that are embedded in the community. But oftentimes people don't know that it is extension that is doing this work. So we're trying to find ways to, um, to promote the work that's being done, but also as we shift into a new way of doing this work, um, we need to shift the way that we measure and evaluate our work. Uh, policy systems and environment work, um, work on building coalitions is very process heavy. So how do we find intermediate measures along the way to measure that we're making progress towards our goals. Next slide, please. So the fourth recommendation, establishing partnerships. Um, again, today is a great example. Um, Suzanne talked about some of the USDA NIFA partnerships with Extension. Um, those partnerships are not just at the national level, but also at the local level. So Extension is, is already doing work in building partnerships, but we really want to look at building coalitions and finding ways to not just be um, the, the research coming in and providing educational programs to individuals and groups, but, but finding ways to really form a true partnership and collaboration within our communities um, and also build the work that Extension is doing in relation to health. Next slide, please. And then the fifth and final recommendation to utilize a community development approach. Um, again, this is already going on, but trying to really focus on this, hone in on it, um, because in order to have that collective impact, we need to work within our communities and building the strength of our ability to partnership. Um, there are several, uh, several trainings and uh, several different uh, methods and thoughts about ways to build coalitions. But again, it, it's refocusing extensions approach from providing um, individual educational programs into a, a larger uh, a larger approach looking at the context in which people live and how do we help improve the context of, of folks in our communities. Next slide, please. So a few ways, Extension is already doing this work and is addressing obesity through cooperative extension. Next slide. Suzanne mentioned SNAP-Ed and FNEP. Um, SNAP-Ed is the educational branch of the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, formerly known as Food Stamps. Um, SNAP-Ed and FNEP both provide direct education, and then they also provide obesity prevention. And you can see there, there's a really impactful reach. Um, SNAP-Ed reached 1.7 million Americans last year. Um, FNEP reached a quarter of a million adults and youth. And the results that they're having from this work is very impressive. Um, 
being able to facilitate people managing their food resources, improve their diet, and increase physical activity. And both SNAP-Ed and FNAP are working to build on this policy systems and environmental approach, which again is looking at the context in which people live, work, eat, and play, and trying to improve the context so people have the opportunity to have to make healthy choices. Next slide, please. So Extension is also doing extensive work in diabetes and physical activity. Um, based on uh, reports from 28 land-grant universities, we reached over 50,000 people last year with diabetes-related programs, including Dining with Diabetes and Diabetes Prevention Program. And over 100,000 people were reached um, with walking programs designed to increase physical activity and reduce sedentary behavior. Next slide, please. So the CDC High Obesity Program, or HOP, is, is a wonderful example of the way that Extension collaborates with um, national level funders, the CDC. It's a five-year cooperative agreement with Extension, and it's based in counties that have adult obesity rates of over 40%. The goal of HOP is to increase access to healthy foods and increase access to physical activity. Next slide, please. So HOP and the extension framework um, overlap, and, and HOP is a perfect example of extension strength in, in moving forward the recommendations in the HOP, or I'm sorry, in the extension framework. Um, health equity is a focus of the high obesity program. Again, using that specific data to find out which where are people suffering from these health inequities and how do we address this? Um, extensive use of community assessment and building partnerships and coalitions in the communities to do the work to, to improve um, the resources to health that, that people experience in a community. Next slide, please. So currently, um, HOP is in its second cycle. This cycle will end in 2023. 15 states, 56 counties have HOP. And some examples of the kind of work that's being done, um, work with food banks and food pantries to implement um, systems to improve their procurement systems to provide healthier food that's distributed by food banks, um, helping individual level food pantries implement healthy eating research guidelines, helping them choose and support donations to the food pantries that are healthier options. Um, another great example of work that's HOP, that HOP is currently doing is their work to help communities develop community connectivity plans that include um, access to physical activity resources like parks, uh, trails, access to outdoor physical activity equipment, and then helping communities plan for what their goals are and then helping them break down those plans into smaller projects and helping find uh, support for those smaller projects. Next slide, please. So the first cycle of HOP um, had really wonderful results. Um, 1.5 million people had increased access to healthy food. 1.6 million people had increased access to physical activity. And uh, $7.5 million was leveraged to support and enhance the efforts of, of the HOP work. Um, the current HOP cycle concludes this September and the next cycle will start in October of 2023. There's 16 expected awards. And again, it'll run through extension based on extension's um, ability to collaborate within the community, the trust, um, and the, the experience that extension has with all of this work to help improve health equity, um, to help build the strength of our communities. So next slide, please. Thank you. Turn it over to Melissa. Thank you, Carrie. And thank you to all of our speakers today. That was a fabulous presentation. Uh, we have lots of great um, informative links in the chat. So if you haven't had a chance to look at the chat yet, I, I would urge you to um, look at the resources there as well. Um, we do have a few moments now for a question and answer. Um, so I invite you to um, Ask your questions in the, the Q&A box that you'll see at the bottom of your screen. 
Um, we do have a, a, a question uh, comment um, about uh, training and um, uh, the attendee writes that, you know, many of us are working in extension, understand the importance of and want to be working alongside um, limited resource community members, um, but but don't have necessarily the direct experience. Um, and uh, the writer um, stresses that there's a need for training our staff on how to work with populations in a way that is trauma-informed and respectful of lived experiences that go beyond the basics of data research and understanding biases. So I was wondering if anyone on the panel might want to address the, the issue of training and how um, you help bridge that, that gap. Well, I'll I'll give it a I'll give it a shot at this particular point, and uh, I see uh, the first comment, and then I'll, I mean the first question, and then the second question as well. Uh, that both uh, are very important. The first one, there's several strategies that I think we're using right now um, to um, help with, particularly that first question. Um, and uh, one of the things that we're doing right now is we have had a series of what we're calling. Um, lightning sessions where extension staff, faculty from land grant universities across the country can uh, participate in a web based uh, peer sharing experience where they share some of the strategies that they have used, you know, to accomplish some of the goals of health equity and some of these other pieces. We plan to continue those. We've been uh, having roughly 100 people at each of those sessions where six to eight land grant universities kind of in in, in uh, five slides or seven minutes are able to really talk about, here's some of the things that worked in our community. So peer sharing is one of the pieces too. We have also uh, engaged with another partner uh, to develop what we're calling a playbook that includes some of the things in terms of how do you work with these populations that uh, are uh, experiencing some of these challenges. So look for later in the year a playbook to come out in that area. And uh, we also, I think, and probably aware of, we also have a community of practice of about 1,700 people from across Cooperative Extension who uh, communicate online where they can, in fact, add blog posts and questions and, and things like that, where they can, in fact, um, hear from other people across the country that are experiencing some of the challenges. But I, I agree absolutely with, the, with that question is that we really have to move beyond the framework to how do we work with these populations in these ways uh, that are most effective. And then with the second one, too, I would also agree, uh, you know, a lot of our work, you know, that we've done in the area of health, uh, uh, equity and well-being, and more generally health in the past has been uh, confined heavily to our family and consumer sciences programs. But I agree, Aurora, that all extension professionals play an important role. And uh, one of the things we're trying to do is position our work in this area, particularly health, as something that cuts across all of our program areas in extension, including 4-H, including ag and natural resources, including community development. Uh, so that is one of our goals moving forward is making sure that we position this as something that transcends our historical silos. So thank you for both of those questions. Hey, thank you. Next question, could you discuss evaluation and what success looks like for this major set of initiatives? And maybe that would be a question for Suzanne um, or again, anyone in the panel is welcome to, to take it. Carrie, you wanna talk about our relationship with the Center for Community Health and Evaluation? Sure. So what one of the things um, that has come up as we're looking at the framework and, and implementation of the framework is exactly that issue. How do we measure and evaluate the work that we're doing when we're we're really talking about it, a way that our system, the way that the extension system does its work? Um, so one of the steps that we've taken is in collaboration with CCHE, we formed a metrics working group. And so we're trying to figure out ways to, um, you know, we, we need a new way to measure the work that we're doing because this is different work than we've traditionally done. 
And so we've broken that down into, into several groups. We're gonna be doing um, some work at NHOC uh, for those of you who are attending the National Health Outreach Conference in May at Cornell. Um, we're gonna be doing some sessions there um, about metrics. We're really trying to understand what are the individual performance metrics that extension professionals need to be able to use to report their work. We also want to look at what are the metrics we need to use as a system to see our progress towards these goals and the recommendations of the framework. Um, so th these are some of the things that we're thinking about and we're, we're putting together groups that are going to work on this. Um, Roger, would you have anything to add to that? Uh, yeah, the other piece I might add, too, is that we have been working with the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. The Robert Wood Johnson Foundation has been a partner with us for the last six years to help support this transformation. And uh, as Carrie mentioned, the Center for Community Health and Evaluation at Kaiser Permanente has been contracted as um, our evaluator to really see how our system changes and to help us monitor progress as we move ahead. So, um, uh, a lot of that is thanks due both to the investment of NIFA in this system-wide transformation, but also the investment Robert Wood Johnson Foundation has made in helping us catalyze the transformation, but also measuring changes in cooperative extension over the last five years. Great, thank you. Uh, question for Suzanne. Um, working with community members to create trusting relationships, we need some flexible grant options that allow communities um, uh, diners and stipends for particip for participation. Uh, can extension or other funding sources allow those activities and fund these? I'm not going to give, you know, a 100% clear answer here, but I wanted to flag that um, I know that my national program leaders and our grants management specialists and staff are standing by. And as you're working on creating budgets and looking at um, what you're putting into your grant proposals, you just need to have those conversations. And so I do believe that um, we are and have some, some room within our policies. It just depends on, on how you write those, uh, what type of grant you're applying for. And again, having those conversations. And we know, um, like I know working in tribal communities, how important it is to have um, those stipends and, and those those meals. Um, and so again, it's it's just a conversation. And then we also have open sessions where we do like our NIFA listen sessions. And we encourage you all to, to provide comments and information into those sessions because they drive changes um, that you want to see here. I want to shift really quick. There was something too we were um, provided in, in the chat box as well, and I wanted to address it while I had the floor as far as, as the training. I also um, was not able to talk about, but we're going to be doing some intersections with uh, Women, Infants, and Children, WIC, and uh, Food and Nutrition Service, and the Workforce. Um, and what that looks like, um, not only with the future WIC professionals, but also our FNEP. Um, I don't want to speak on behalf of SNAPED, but the, you know, the overlap with SNAPED and really what that looks like. And that will involve training components for sure, too. So I just wanted to alert that there seems to be a lot of opportunities that will be forthcoming around not only future workforce, uh, but training for um, many of these questions that have been brought up today. Excellent. Thank you. Excellent. Um, good. So thank you again um, to all of our speakers for the presentation today. Um, we, we really look forward to learning more and um, appreciate your time and sharing the fabulous work that you are doing. Um, so we'd like to wrap up today just uh, with a few Encore announcements. Um, so if we can move to next slide. Um, so a few uh, publications and um, uh, resources that are available to you. Uh, the Encore Annual Report is now available online. And the report this year has a focus on community research and community engagement. So uh, you can find that on our website at Encore.org. Uh, uh, next slide. We have a new publication in the American Journal of Preventive Medicine uh, titled National Collaborative on Childhood Obesity Research Efforts to Advance 
Childhood Obesity Research Progress and Next Steps. It is a review of the last decade of NCOR progress um, and offers a, a really uh, nice illustration of the effectiveness of public health collaboratives. So uh, you can link to that um, from our website. Uh, it's open access uh, journal article. Next slide. Uh, we have our student newsletter. So if you or someone you know is a student, please encourage them to sign up for the NCOR Student Hub um, to get updates on the latest NCOR publications, tools, and resources. Next slide. And that's uh, just a, a sample of some of the resources we have available on the Student Hub webpage. Have you used any of NCOR's tools? We would love to hear from you. You can email us at NCOR at FHI360.org. Uh, you may be featured in uh, our next webinar or a case study. Uh, so please um, share with us uh, your success stories. We would love to hear them. And if you don't already, please follow us on social media. We are at, at NCOR on Twitter and NCOR.org on Facebook. And you can contact us um, again at NCOR at FHI360.org um, or visit us online. Um, following this webinar, um, the evaluation form will be available for you. And we really encourage you to take a moment to, to take those survey. Um, we appreciate your input and it's helpful for us to make sure that we are offering you um, content that you are um, looking for. So we appreciate your feedback. The recording for today's webinar will be on the NCOR website in um, approximately a week. Um, so it, you can check back or if you haven't already, please sign up for our NCOR newsletter um, to be notified of when the recording is available. Um, and thank you again um, for, I think that is our last slide, just to confirm. Yes. So thank you again for our audience and to all our speakers uh, for taking time um, to share the fabulous work that you are doing. We hope everyone has a great rest of your day and we look forward to seeing you again at the next NCOR webinar. So thank you so much.